Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, as I say, I'm Richard Bradbury, um, and um, thank you very much for the invitation to come and talk to you today a little bit about um, broadcasting over the internet. Um, I'm going to be uh, kicking off with a little bit of the, uh, the problem statement, and then I'm going to be handing over to my colleague, uh, Lucas, who's going to tell you a bit about the uh, solutions that we've come up with. Um, so, here's a nice picture. Um, life in the past used to be really easy for broadcasters. We used to build a production centre, put a transmitter in the air, and start broadcasting. Um, and it didn't really matter how many people were watching, it will cost the same amount of money to run the system. Um, but unfortunately, as you all know, the internet doesn't work like that. Um, and um, since, um, I think, December 2007, when we, when we launched the, uh, the iPlayer service, uh, this is what's happened. <coughs> And that's a pretty much uh, a consistent growth curve there. Uh, year on year, there's a little bit of um, fluctuation, seasonal variation. People tend to watch a bit more of the iPlayer in the winter months uh, when the weather's bad, and in the summer months, they're out playing. Um, and then there's a little bit of a fluctuation. Every four years, we have the Olympics, which is quite a big event. Every two years, there's a World Cup, so that's quite a big event. Um, but uh, broadly speaking, um, we're doing really well. And in fact, um, yeah, I've put some of the figures up there from last year. On average, we had 272 million on-demand requests uh, per month uh, over the course of uh, 2017. And Blue Planet 2 was obviously massive for us last year. Um, 4.8 million people uh, watched that on the iPlayer. Um, just the first episode, that is. Now, um, obviously, as you all know, uh, we, we use CDNs to help us with the distribution to get scalability, and they charge us um, for every byte that they deliver to an endpoint. And so as we get more popular, it hurts our pocket more and more. It gets more and more expensive to, to deliver the service, and that's completely the opposite of, of broadcasting, which is a flat curve. Now, you might think that on-demand viewing is gaining ground, and you'd be right. Um, and you can see the, the, the lower line there uh, shows the growth uh, of on-demand over the past, what is that, uh, since 2006. Um, and then, uh, commensurately, the, the, uh, the, the linear viewing on traditional TV is going down. These are the figures for the, uh, for the main broadcasters. And that, that lower curve actually includes all time shifting, so it's people recording things on DVRs, as well as downloading and, and streaming. It's all the time shifting. And we find that that really works very well for quite a lot of uh, genres, like drama, comedy, entertainment, documentary. Um, but actually, uh, a lot of people do still want to watch linear TV, and we think that will always be the case for big events and for sport and, um, and perhaps for news as well, especially for breaking news. And just to give a couple of examples of that, um, our biggest streaming event to date uh, was the, uh, the Euro uh, 2016 competition, the England versus Wales match. Um, and you can see that uh, uh, I think it's almost 20% um, of the peak audience were, were watching online. 2.3 million is quite a large number um, out of nearly 10 million people there. Um, and just for comparison, here's the figure for uh, the Super Bowl 52 uh, a couple of weeks ago in the States. And that, obviously, that's a m much bigger event. Um, it's, uh, well, what's that, uh, ten, more than 10 times the, the size of the audience. Um, but actually, curiously, most of those people were still sticking to um, traditional broadcast TV, even though actually the figures were slightly down on last year's uh, Super Bowl uh, for the, uh, the TV viewing audience. But overall, I think it was larger. Um, but it's still only 3.1 million, and that's a mere 3%. So there's a quite a lot of potential for growth. And, and those figures are quite scary figures for us, really. And at the same time, we've got this uh, problem with more and more bits to shift. So we've got new technologies coming on board. Uh, we've got uh, 4K um, TV, ultra-high definition. We've got high dynamic range. We've got all sorts of new content experiences, 360-degree video, augmented reality, virtual reality, you name it. And all of this is uh, going to drive our costs up because there's more and more bits to be sh shifted. And then at the same time, uh, we've got uh, the mobile phone guys uh, biting at our heels. Um, I've just shown uh, on that diagram there, uh, we've had one spectrum auction already and lost a whole chunk of terrestrial spectrum to the mobile phone companies for 4G. And then there's a, another chunk uh, due to be auctioned 
uh, real soon, uh, so we'll lose a little bit more. And in the meantime, the mobile phone companies uh, are defining ways of, of doing broadcasting themselves. There's a system called MBMS, which they've defined in 3GPP for doing uh, media streaming. So all of this means that uh, our ability to innovate in this space and do interesting things with new technologies is really constrained, especially, especially on, on Freeview. So really the challenge that's been set for us by our management is to imagine a world where the transmitters just go away. And we're calling this the IP glide path. And really the challenge is, is how we're going to make our services get to 98% of, of, of the UK license fee payers. Um, and it's, it's, it's really hard. Um, and just to put all the numbers into perspective, the last Royal Wedding, we, I know we've got another one coming up soon, but the last Royal Wedding um, attracted 25 million viewers across all platforms. So I suppose the question for us is, how could we, how could we deliver that service using only the internet? Um, so in other words, that's 10 times the audience of the Euros, and you know, with all these t new technologies, it could be five times the encoded bit rate. So it's a massive 50 times on the load for, uh, for unicast streaming. And even, even if the CDNs uh, could deliver that, and, and, and maybe they could scale up to that, we probably couldn't even afford to do it. So the question that we asked ourselves is, what about multicast? And that's the challenge that I set my uh, research team at BBC Research and Development uh, to try and come up with some solutions in this space. And we've been doing that for the, for the past few years. And I'm just going to hand over to Lucas now, who's going to tell you a little bit about uh, some of the solutions that we've come up with. Thank you, Richard. So <clears throat> we needed a solution in this space, and to really be able to measure the success of that solution, we set some objectives up. And uh, in, in doing these objectives, what we found is that we really uh, help drive our technology choices here. So working through these from top to bottom, uh, Richard's mentioned IP multicast. Um, and really, that's to address the mass audience reliably over managed and unmanaged networks. Um, so as, as a broadcaster, you need to be able to target lots of different kinds of networks. Um, and I'll come on to a little bit more about IP multicast in a few slides. Uh, but looking more at the, the, the more interesting technology stuff here than the newer things, um, we, we wanted to use a common media packaging across the unicast and multicast delivery modes. Um, we think fragmented MP4 is a good option in this space, so using ISO, BMFF, or maybe in the future something like CMAF. Um, and, you know, dynamic adaptation is a, a useful technique to help mitigate or react to variable network conditions out there on real networks. So, you might be familiar with some of the technologies in that space, but we see MPEG Dash as, as something that could be uh, quite good in the future in the direction of travel. So we, we would use that, and we'd have different bitrate encodings available on different multicast groups. Um, one thing we want to try and do, though, is to avoid client complexity. Um, that's either you know, user experience complexity or just uh, kind of footprint install. Uh, manageability, those kinds of aspects. So the way we're approaching that is to have a common network or common network protocols across both unicast and delivery modes where possible. So the way we see that working is to have HTTP as a common layer seven across multicast delivery and, and to use unicast there as a repair mechanism, which I'll explain in a couple of slides time, and to use quick as a, you know, a common layer four. So UDP and multicast IP combined um, to give us this uh, simple, straightforward standard mapping of HTTP to a multicast domain. And, and finally, that's no good if you can't discover the thing in the first place. So there's various discovery technologies. SDP comes to mind, but it's a bit long in the tooth. And we feel that something better. So we've taken something called HTTP alternative services, kind of bent it into a mode that can operate to our needs, um, and I'll explain that again in a couple of slides. So looking at IP multicast, um, you know, we're aware that it doesn't come for free, it doesn't come without some problems, but you know, layer two packet replication is efficient. So um, let's try and hone things down to try and address some concerns. We're looking at source-specific multicast to try and avoid some of that additional load on network routers, and we're looking at IPv4, but really IPv6 as well we think that will help ease some deployment aspects and address some of the, the address-based concerns. Um, and in our system design, we intend to put some reasonable bound on the total number of uh, 
multicast groups that we're using um, just to help keep state down. But I, know I mentioned quick earlier, so I'd just like to kind of uh, come up with a foundation there so we're all familiar with the terms that we might be using. Um, apologies if this repeats things, but I'll skim over some of these details. You know, QUIC is just a new transport protocol designed to address some of the long-standing issues with TCP. So this is something that was originally developed by Google, um, and it's been transitioned into the ITF for standardization, and they're targeting publication of a, a whole set of documents by the end of this year. Um, so like TCP, it's connection-oriented and reliable. Um, unlike TCP, it's got security factored in by design from the outset. So these features, as I mentioned, are layered on top of UDP. Um, the main benefit of that is that it allows kind of rapid iteration. It pulls things away from kernel space and uh, allows the likes of Google to experiment. Um, you know, they have brought a lot of experimental data to the IETF to help kind of justify the adoption of this work. Um, yeah. Early in the work of Quick, um, there was a lot of research or development into improving page load time. That's really where it came from. So the, this idea of fast connection establishment using zero round trip time or one round trip time um, handshaking. So this is achieved by caching and subsequently using security context. Now, a lot of that learning and experimental, experimental data is factored back into the TLS 1.3 um, design process, which is, you know, getting rubber stamped hopefully soon. So that's maybe not such a key feature of Quick alone these days, but neither is it that important for this multicast uh, streaming use case that we have in mind, but it's, it's a nice to have. Uh, and finally, um, you know, I, I mentioned the long-standing shortcomings of TCP, so really we're talking header line blocking there. Um, so Quick has this idea of multiplexing on logical application streams, um, so a single connection where any one particular stream that experiences loss doesn't block other streams, and then you've got some connection or congestion control and flow control there as well. And to see how that layers up to things, um, and what we meant earlier by common layer seven and layer four. Um, what, what, by that, what we mean is the HTTP kind of request response primitives or the interface that can present those things. So the commonality there at layer seven is that every object has a uniquely identifiable uniform relo resource locator common across both modes of delivery. Um, the top bar here is an MPEG dash application, but Really, it's, it could be anything. It's files, file delivery mode, say. Um, and uh, you know, what's important there is not just the files, but the metadata that's associated with them. Um, you, know, you can use your imagination for the kinds of HTTP metadata that could be useful. Caching primitives come to mind, um, content encodings, those sorts of things. Um, and in the case of the multicast transmissions, we basically are using the server push mode of HTTP. So that's delivering pseudo requests from client to server. Um, and again, that can just carry the metadata. So you know, if you look at this diagram and on the left-hand side, that's kind of the old world in gray. That's what's out there in unicast HTTP land. But you know, we, we've got a future in mind where you know, hopefully implementations have transitioned to unicast quick. So just using the HTTP over quick mapping which was inspired by H2, um, but is effectively building on that, subsuming some of that capability into the quick layer um, and, and reaping some of the benefits that come from experience and uh, improved transport layer support for the kinds of things that uh, need to be done. But in that future, we can move over to the right-hand side and have multicast too. Now, that doesn't come for free. There's some gaps that don't quite let us have that. So I'll explain how we address those on the next slide. But you could see how in this future, we've got a client with just a single stack that can reuse the layer seven and layer four um, primitives. So that helps address some of the complexity that we mentioned. Um, and in this model of deployment, unlike some previous multicast models like DVB, IBTV, um, you know, the multicast is an optimization path where available. So a client would detect 
the availability of multicast and also try it out. It would probe it, and if so, switch over. But otherwise, the unicast is the primary delivery mode. And when it has switched over the client to multicast, it can use the unicast as a repair service. So I talked about the gaps, uh, what we did in designing the solution, looking at the spec and how we might be able to prototype this thing. Um, we, we basically collected those thoughts in an independent internet draft called HTTP of a multicast quick. Um, that describes how you can do service discovery using alternative services. Um, and I'll give an example of that in a couple of slides. And, and like I said, it's, it's really a, a generic level use case. And you might think that we can specialize that. And we did. Um, so I'll explain that in a few slides. But going back to just conventional distribution. This is a, you know, kind of helps explain the concept and how we might deploy things. Ignoring multicast for a moment. Um, from a left to right model, which some people don't like, we've got some black lines which just kind of represent actions that a player application would take. So it would do a bit of this service discovery to find you know, um, the content that is of interest and then uh, kind of action that to a broker who would ultimately determine the correct content host to go to for that streaming session. And then the steady state hits, which is just HTTP or unicast HTTP represented by the uh, solid bold orange line there. And obviously, behind the content hosting, you've got some packaging and encoding going on, and maybe some local interfaces, some additional management service configuration going on. So that's that. We talk about discovery. So this is an example. Um, we think alt service is a really powerful abstraction. I mean, the main benefit, just in unicast terms, is that by adding a response header to an object, you're able to um, direct a client to another host that is completely authoritative for that origin. But it's, it's a hint. Clients uh, can determine if they're capable of using this. The, the advertisement is able to, to not only switch hosts, but protocol. So you could advertise unicast quick, um, or in this example, something we called HQM, which is HTTP over multicast quick. Um, and the key point is that it doesn't change the effective URL. This happens transparently under the application layer or the UX. So um, if you were to, to you know, potentially visit a Google service right now, you would um, see your address bar, HTTPS, colon slash slash Google, blah, blah, blah. And underneath you, your client or your user agent could be switching to Quick um, and using a different network stack underneath, but that URL that's presented to you is no different. This is really powerful for something like Dash, where we have a manifest describing resources with URLs or base URLs and redirections that um, effectively the whole ecosystem just continues working. And to be able to apply that to multicast allows us a very simple transition or handoff between multicast and unicast that's seamless. And it's that seamlessness that really helps play in with the common layer seven, and it all works nicely. So how do we use it? Um, in this case, in this example, what we have is a client making a request for a segment belonging to, say, representation one. On the response given from the server, we attach this alt service header. Um, so we've got here the protocol ID, which I've already mentioned. And what this is then doing is directing the client to a IPv6 group address, FFE. 3E1234 and the port number 2000. There's some caching ability here, so you can say that this advertisement is valid for two hours. This is 7,200 seconds. Um, and then there's a load of additional stuff. So what this is intended to do is um, replace the quick handshake. So for each quick connection or session, there's a number of characteristics of that that need to be negotiated in a bidirectional way. But Obviously, for multicast, that's not feasible. Our design doesn't have a return channel to help address some of the scalability aspects of things. So we, we effectively um, advertise that up front, and the client can make an informed decision if it believes that that multicast session is uh, useful to it. So you know, it could use a source address and combine that with a group address to determine if for that network segment uh, multicast is available. Um, we've got stuff like a quick version to enable iteration upon the standards. Uh, you could decide if that's compatible with its stack. 
implementation. There's some other stuff there about security, um, which I won't go into during this presentation. So if we go back to our distribution architecture and how, how do we actually use that, yeah, we, uh, we kind of just add an alt service to the content hosting. But the keen item amongst you will see that we've also introduced a new component here called the client proxy that sits between the player and the content hosting. So what this is capable of doing is converting between multicast and unicast. Now, the reason we need this is that you know, right now, client or player applications don't necessarily support native multicast reception. So this client proxy component can be deployed in various locations and, and do that multicast to unicast conversion such that the, the actions one and two there are just normal unicast HTTP. So um, you know, in deployment, clients are able to get some of the benefits of that scalable distribution um, but not be required to support this. And Exorcist gives us a pathway to kind of migration and, and full-time support of this, and I'll explain some of that towards the end of the, this presentation. So if we introduce multicast back into this, you know, we talked about what that might look like, and in this case, the client proxy has, has determined it is able to make use of the multicast service. So. Um, it invokes a subscription to the multicast distribution network, and uh, once content flow begins, sorry, so one key point is that alt service can happen in parallel, so a bit like a happy eyeballs kind of race, while you're receiving, well, until you've established that connection to the alternative, clients are encouraged to continue interactions with the origin. So in this case, that is unicast fetching of resources that are uh, related to that MPEG dash streaming session. And until the multicast subscription is taking place, until the client proxy is happy that it's receiving segments that are being sent to it, um, it will continue using unicast as the primary mode. Once that transition to multicast has succeeded, unicast effectively becomes the backup. So you can imagine some packet loss occurring, which would just mean a range of bytes in, in a segment body are missing. Um, the client proxy could just make a simple unicast range request to the content host to repair those things um, just in time for the player to uh, request them and get them returned. So I talked about prototypes. Um, we've taken our internet draft and specialized it for the linear media streaming use case. So we envisage that this particular profile of HTTP over multicast quick could be standardized. We wanted to come up with something that was very useful to people, but then also use our <coughs> knowledge and expertise um, in media streaming. And so what we've done is, as part of our work with DVB and their working groups, we're looking at sharing some of that knowledge and expertise and um, you know, maybe standardizing in a domain more suited towards media. Um, and what we've done is built an end-to-end -end working prototype. So we have a multicast sender using this protocol and a client proxy receiver that can receive it. Um, this is built on the earlier Quick, uh, Google Quick specification. Um, there's a fair amount of fundamental changes to the protocol syntax happening in IETF land, and we'd like for that to kind of bottom out, settle down until we, um, we move over there. But the fundamentals are the same. The, the common layer seven, the, the high level system design still holds true. Um, and where we've been able to deploy those things to are a client proxy running on embedded devices such as a Raspberry Pi or OpenWRT router. So you can see how that might fit into a, a customer premises. Um, we're also looking to the future as well and how we might get native support for this. So, you know, using or, or pulling that client proxy functionality into a web browser. And as you can imagine, plugging IP multicast into that environment is pretty tricky. So, um, you know, we've got a long term goal, but we're hitting some issues along the way and looking at trying to solve those in various forms. So that's where you guys come in. We'd like to understand how our technology works on real ISP networks. We, we've done a lot of lab testing, um, and in that we've tried to design adaptation algorithms that can uh, understand or work with multicast networks, network congestion and packet loss. Um, and, and we've had some success in that, but we, we'd like to understand how things perform in the real world. So what we have is a head-end system, the 
deployed on the internet, originating dash streams over our multicast quick profile. Um, and what we'd like to do is install some receivers in real customer premises. Um, so if you're interested in any way, please come and have a talk to us. Um, yes. Um, and with that, I'll hand back to Richard to conclude the talk. Thanks. Cheers. So, uh, well, thanks very much for listening. Uh, yeah, as, as, as you've seen, you know... Um, oh, it's the wrong way around. There we go. Um, so this is, this is our manifesto, really. We think that the future of, um, of uh, linear TV distribution over IP networks probably will end up being a mixture of CDNs and multicast. We, we'll still need CDN... Um, capabilities to provide the repair mechanism, but uh, where multicast is available, um, maybe in small islands, maybe in, 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 in larger areas, um, people can really get the scalability for doing uh, very large events. Um, and those two, those two systems work hand in hand. Um, and Lucas has told you a little bit about this common layer 7 approach with HTTP, and then underneath we're really interested in, in QUIC as, as a way of getting a common layer 4 syntax. And all, uh, and all of that gets wrapped up with this alternative services um, discoverability aspect to, 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 to create quite a, quite a, what we think is quite a neat package and something that could reduce the footprint of implementations. So we don't have to have a complex set of different protocol stacks. You can have common, um, common libraries between the unicast and the multicast worlds. And as you've seen, we've, we've prototyped uh, a system that demonstrates these general principles. But really, what we want to do now is to, uh, is to try them out and see, see how they work in practice on real networks. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much for your time. Um, do you have any uh, questions for us? Oh, look, hands are going up all over the place. First of all, did anyone spot the deliberate mistake on the earlier slide where we described uh, multicast as a layer two packet replication? <laughs> um, right, OK, so uh, we've got a question yes. over there. Hi. Thomas Manganix Networks. Uh, thank you very much. I see that working. Um, one thing which I think you may not have considered because you use Quick and Quick is secure is caching because many enterprises or people like us will provide content filtering, have proxy online, and if, for example, we are going to get the, get the request through the proxy, decrypt, reissue the connection to yourself, we could cache. So did you put any thought on caching? Because if you come back before the CDN days, on the old 2000 days, where ISP were running their own cache, people like the BBC didn't need any CDN, because ISP were doing the caching on the network. And if you have a way to put appliance on our network, which could cast those streams when there is no multicast, we could save a lot of requests going to you. Because if I can run a box in my networks, which will cache your streams, and I can route, it, route your network to it, and it suddenly magically helps, it saves me money. So I may do it myself part of my R&D, because we have a caching product in my network. I'm quite unique for that. But you may very well provide open source or access to software that ISP can run on the network to do the savings. Wow. I mean, so there's, there's a lot of really interesting meat there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the, a lot of what we're doing is really sort of weighing up these two different options, these kind of CDN type architectures with um, multicast architectures. And we don't really see them as um, either or. We, we definitely see them as probably complementary <coughs> technologies. And we've given one example of that. But I mean, what, what you're talking about is, is an alternative, right? So what, what, what one, of the, one of the options that, that we could imagine is, is having multicast in the core of the network to some edge caches, and then, uh, and then use it using caches at the edge, um, maybe in addition to multicast, or maybe as an alternative to multicast. Yeah, and 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 some of these security issues are, are, are completely relevant there. I mean, what, what, one of the items we glossed over a little bit in the talk today is the uh, is the issue with um, the fact that, that, as you say, quick naturally has an encrypted mode, um, and it's assumed that it is, it is going to be encrypted. Now, if you're, going to, if you're going to send that over a multicast connection, you're going to have to distribute the key to everyone that wants to receive it. Um, and so the, the, the benefits of the transport level encryption are somewhat negated there. And that's, that's why you need additional features as well to just to prove the authenticity and the integrity of, of, the, of the material. Uh, specifically on, on caching, uh, we've been involved um, in some of the working groups in the IETF, and they have been discussing some, some, of, the, some of the issues that you're talking about. And one, there was a proposal actually last year, I think was it, um, called Blind Caching, and there were some uh, internet drafts proposed there. 
there whereby um, you could deliver a, effectively an encrypted payload to a CDN and and it could, be, it could be stored in an encrypted form and then decrypted by the end client. So you can see how lots of these different Lego bricks could be assembled together into a um, more flexible system. Uh, James Plasson from JISC. So you said you're going to make the proxy server bit available for small routers. Are you going to potentially open source and make the code available so people can integrate it into slightly larger routers? Oh, yeah. Or Cody boxes. Yeah, potentially. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if I mean, if 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 if, if this became if, if if this became a success, yeah, obviously we 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 we'd consider that. I mean, it's really still at the uh, the, the lab trial stage at, the, at this point. But yeah, potentially. Yeah. Okay. Hi, uh, Rob Evans from JISC. I'm just going to point out that we already have a multicast peering with uh, BBC r and I'd love to try this. Very good. Thank you very much. If you're, very, if, if, well, if you're interested in talking to us, uh, come and see us in the break. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you. Right. Well, thank thank you. you very much, Richard and Lucas.